Brachos daf mem dalid contains two mishnayos and takes us to the end of the parak. Discusses situations in which bread will not get a bracha because it is tough or subservient to something else. It talks about peres genosar, special fruits near the kineret, and describes their wonderful qualities. It talks about certain things which you need to have as part of a meal. It brings another mishnah which discusses the correct bracha chrona on certain types of fruits and water. The halachos of brachos and water all together. The Gemara will tell us about the bracha of al-michya, the correct text for it. And then the Gemara contains a lengthy list of healthy foods and what they are good for and what other foods are bad for. The Mishnah, which begins the daf, discusses the halacha, in which bread can actually become tuffle, can become subservient to another food, and the bracha on that food would be the bracha for the bread as well. You would only have to say that bracha. You would not say a separate bracha on the bread. It's called a tuffel. The Mishnah gives an, the Mishnah gives an example of this, where if you're eating a very salty food first, and then you eat bread afterwards, the implication seems to be that the bread is coming to assuage the saltiness that one has in his mouth, in order to mitigate it. So then the only purpose of the bread is to complement the salted food, or the pickled food, you would not say a bracha on the bread. The Mishnah says the rule is, anytime you eat bread but it's serving something else, you don't say a bracha on the bread, it's included in the bracha on the other food. Now the Gemara asks, how could you have a situation where bread is tough to something else, where bread is subservient to something else, the bread is always the main part of the meal. The Gemara answers, Rav Achabed, the Rav Avira said, in the Ravashi, if you're eating peros genosar, fruits of genosar, Rashi explains genosar is the region around the Yam Kinneret, the Kinneret Sea, and over there the fruits were exceptionally sweet, if you're eating that, the bread becomes subservient. Rashi's implication is that the bread is subservient to those fruits, but then, then that has nothing to do with a salty food. So Tosis explains that you would have to eat salty foods to counteract the sweetness of the fruits, and then you would have to eat bread to counteract the saltiness of the salty food. In a situation like that, you would end up eating something so salty that you would need bread to complement it. Now the Gemara launches into a description of the amazing quality of the fruits of Ginosar. The Gemara says that Rabbi Barbachana said we were walking behind Rabbi Yechanan on his way to pick fruits of Ginosar to eat. And sometimes we were in a group of 100 and we each picked 10 fruits. Sometimes we were in a group of 10 and we each picked 100 fruits. Either way, there was 1,000 fruits. And Rabbi Yechanan would eat them all and he would say, it's like I didn't eat anything. So the Gemara asks, it's like I didn't eat anything. These fruits, Vigamar says, was enough to fill baskets containing three saw each. A hundred of these fruits filled a three saw size basket. That means that each hundred fruits was about the volume of 432 eggs. Altogether, a thousand fruits would be 4,320 eggs size. So how can you say that it didn't eat anything? Umar says, no, he meant that he wasn't full. He said, I, I didn't need anything filling. Uh, the implication here is that the fruits are so delicious that the more you eat, the more you want to eat, and you don't feel like you had enough from them, even though you ate a thousand of them. Now the Gemara quotes a number of other uh, Amaraim who ate Ginosar fruits and the effect that it had on them. Rabbi Avo ate it until the, a fly sl- would slip off his forehead. Raj explains that his face glowed from the fruits and it would cause his, his skin to become slippery and a fly would slip right off. Rabbi Yame Ravasi ate it until their hair fell out. Rav Shimon ben Lakish ate it until he became delirious. And then Rabbi Yechlin would have to go call a troop from the Nesia, from the Nasi, and he, they would take him home. And when Rav Dimi came from Eretz Yisrael, he said the following thing. This is not a specific discussion of the fruits of Ginosar, it's the abundance and the wonderful quality of the fruits of Eretz Yisrael in general. Rav, Rav Dimi said that there was a city um, that belonged to Yanai Hamelach, King Yanai, and the name of the region was called Har Hamelach, and there was a city there that they would have to do the following thing. They would have people picking figs for a week, and there were so many people picking so many figs that they need 600,000 buckets of tuna, of cut tuna, just to feed the pickers. And when Ravin came, he added to this, he said there was a tree that Yanni HaMelech had, that they would, three times a month, they would be able to take off the tree 40 saw worth, again, it's a tremendous amount, 40 saw of young pigeons that roosted in the tree. They would harvest that from the tree. 
Now, Rav Yitzchak said, it was one city in Eretz Yisrael, this is not in Haramelech anymore, but it's somewhere else in Eretz Yisrael, there was a city in Eretz Yisrael called Gufnis. It had 80 pairs of brothers who were married to 80 pairs of sisters, and all of them were Kohanim. So where it says that the the Rabbanon outside Eretz Yisrael tried to find something similar to that, they checked from Surah to Naharda, two major cities, in Bavel, and all they were able to find was the daughters of Reb Chizda that was married to two brothers, Rabbi Bar Chama and Marukva Bar Chama. But Marukva Bar Chama and Rabbi Bar Chama were not Kohanim. The girls were. Reb Chizda was a Kohen, but the boys were not in this case. There was only one set. Now, the Gemara says a couple of statements about meals. Rav says. Any meal that doesn't have salt doesn't count as a real meal. And Mechia Barabbas said the name of Yechanan. Any Suda that doesn't have soup doesn't count as a real meal. And this takes us to the next Mishnah. The Mishnah has two halves. The first half discusses the Racha Achrona on grapes, figs, and pomegranates. Any of the fruits which are the Shiva Saminim, the seven special fruits of Eretz Yisrael, aside from those which are grains. So here we have a Machok is what the Racha Achrona is. Rabbi Gamliel says the bracha chon is bracha samozon, regular thing you would say for bread. And the Chachamim say, no, you say al mechia, or al ha'etz. You say one bracha, which includes aspects of the three brachos of bracha samozon. And Rabbi Kiva adds is that even if you eat something else which fills you up, even if it's just a cooked vegetable, you would still have to say bracha samozon. Now, second half of the Mishnah is what's the correct bracha on water? So you, the Mishnah says if you drink water because you're thirsty, to exclude other reasons, so you say a shahakal, and Rav says, and afterwards you say a burin of fashas abbas of chesar and not. Okay, the Gemara discusses the machokis, what bracha achrona you say on the fruits of the seven special species. Rav Gamliel, we said, says you say bracha samazon, and the Rabbanan say that you just say al ha eights. So Gemara says, what's a machokis? The Gemara says, because if you look in the Pasuk from which we learn Birchas and Mazon, first it lists the seven special fruits. Eretz Chita, Sayer of Gevin, Sayer of Rima, and Eretz Shemun of Devash. Then it has a Pasuk which says, Lebe Miskinos Teichal Balachem. Now you'll eat bread. You won't be poor and you'll eat bread. And then afterwards it says, Viachalta Vistavatu Verachti. You should eat and be full and you should bless Hashem. So the Rabbi Gamil says that Viachalta Vistavatu Verachti. You should eat and be full. And Ben Hashem goes all the way back on everything, not just on the bread which was immediately before it, but it goes back on the Pasuk before that. Which discussed all the seven fruits. So, therefore, you have to say Baruch Samazan even on the seven special fruits. Now, the Rabbanan disagree. Why? They say because there's a Pusik in between. The Pusik in between says Eretz. It splits the discussion. It it says that what comes afterwards does not go all the way back to what we said before. And therefore, the mitzvah of Baruch Samazan, Vichaltaf Zavato Verachta, does not go all the way back on fruits. It only goes back on bread, which was discussed immediately before it. The Gemara says, according to Rabbi Gamliel, what are you going to do with that Eretz? That really does seem to split the discussion into two halves. So Rabbi Gamliel says it only splits it as far as the one thing. It splits it as far as that somebody who chews wheat kernels or barley kernels, not bread, on, for that you do not have to say Berchaz HaMazan. That is the splitting. That is the word Eretz here that splits the discussion. The Pasuk which describes Berchaz HaMazan doesn't go back on that, but on the rest of the fruits, it does. And now the Gemara wants to know what exactly is the text of this bracha achzmi and shalosh, this al michya or this al ha eitz. How does it go? So the Gemara says if you ate fruits, you start off al ha eitz ve al pri ha eitz ve al tenuva sasada. If you ate mizonos, then you start off with al michya ve al kol kol ve al tenuva sasada, and then the rest is the same until the end. It goes. That is the text of the bracha. And how do you end it off? So if you were eating Mizdanus, you end off Ala Michya Valakal Kola Valtinuva Sasode. Now, the Gemara says, how do you end it off if you were in, if you ate fruits? So you're really not supposed to end off with two things. It's supposed to only be one statement in the end off. But we saw that it combines two and considers it to be like one. So how would you do that for fruits? So the Gemara says, um, the Gemara proves first that you can combine the two things into one. On Rosh Chodesh, we say, 
So those two are combined into one. So how do you end it off if you were eating fruits? So the Gemara says, well, a, there's a difference depends who you are and where you are. Rav Chizda, who lived in outside Eretz Yisrael, used to say, Al Eretz Yisrael pay herself on the land and on its fruits. And Rav who lived in Eretz Yisrael, just said on the land and on the fruits. The Gemara says, that's backwards. The Gemara says, yeah, you switch it. The one in Eretz Yisrael, the land and its fruits, because he ate its fruits, he ate the fruits of Eretz Yisrael, that's where he lives. And if you live outside of Eretz Yisrael, you just say on the land and on the fruits. The Gemara fills in the correct brachas are as follows. On fruits, you first say ha'et, and then if it's from the seven special fruits, you say al ha'et. On mizonos, grain-based things, first you say it's the five grains, not just the two that are in the list of the seven special fruits, the five grains, and all five, you first say mizonos, and then afterwards you say al ha'michya. Now the Gemara gets into a discussion about which kind of foods require a bracha chrono altogether. Rav Yitzchuk Bravdimi said the name of Rabbeinu on an egg and on meat, you say a shahakal, and afterwards a bracha chrono. But vegetables, you do not have to say any after bracha on. No bracha chrono. Rabbi Yitzchak said, no vegetables, you do say. Just water, you don't say a bracha chrono. And Papa said, all three. Everything gets a bracha chrono. Now the Gemara notes that Marzutra did like Rabbi Yitzchak bar Avdimi, and Rabbi Yitzchak Barashi did like Rav. Yitzchak. The Gemara says, how do you remember which one did like which? The one who has one name is not listed with his father's name, did like the one who has two names. The one who has two names did like the one who has only one name. And that's how you remember it. Now, Rav Ashi said, sometimes when I used to remember, so I would do like everybody, meaning I would say a Amarna Fashas on all three fruits. Now the Gemara has a Kasha. So the Gemara says we have a Mishnah which says that anything which has a bracha afterwards has a bracha before, but there are some things that have a bracha rishonim but do not have a bracha achrona. The Gemara says, what thing is there that has a bracha rishonim but not a bracha achrona? So according to Rav Yitzchak, where Rav Dimi, very good, vegetables do not have a bracha achrona. According to Rav Yitzchak, water does not have a bracha achrona. According to Rav Papa, everything has a bracha achrona. What is it referring to? Where says it's referring to mitzvahs. Mitzvahs, you have a bracha before, you do the mitzvah, you don't have a bracha afterwards. Where says, but hold on, the people in Eretz Yisrael who do say a bracha after their mitzvah, after they take tefillin off, for example, they say, So what is it to exclude? As the says, to exclude things that have a good smell. You only make a bracha before you smell something and not after you finish smelling it. The Gemara now launches into a discussion which primarily focuses on various different foods and which ones are good for the body and which ones are bad for the body. This will take us to the end of the parak and to the end of the daf. So first is Rav Yana who says that eggs are very good for the body. As a matter of fact, pound for pound, volume for volume, they are the best thing you can possibly eat. Ravin said depends what kind of egg. A lightly roasted egg is better than six loig of fine flour. Rav Dimi said a lightly roasted egg is better than six loig of fine flour, but a fully roasted egg is better than only four loig of fine flour. And a cooked egg is pound for pound better than any other food except for meat. And the Gemara discusses Rabbi Akiva. In the Mishnah, Rabbi Akiva had said that you have to say Berchaz HaMazon on anything, even cooked vegetables. The Gemara says, is there any cooked vegetables that fills you up? Like Berchaz HaMazon, the Gemara says, yes, cabbage does. And the Gemara discusses a brisa. The brisa will continue the list of various different foods, which ones are good for you, which ones are bad for you. And along the way, there will be a mention of cabbage, which the Gemara will explain later, is because it fills you up, and that's why it's quoted here. So the Bryce says as follows, if you eat spleen, it's good for the teeth, it's bad for your stomach. You eat cretion, which is like leek, that is the opposite. That is bad for the teeth, and that is good for the stomach. All other raw vegetables make you greenish skin, make you pale. Anything which is small, that you, it's not fully grown, it'll make you short. Anything which is near the life source of an animal will bring revitalization to you. And anything which is small that you eat whole, the entire creature at once, like small fish, the Gemara will say, that also brings revitalization of the life force. Cabbage is good because it is filling. Beets are, are, are good for cures. And woe is to the stomach that has a turnip passing through it. I think we'll analyze each of these one by one. First of all, we said that spleen is good for the teeth and it's bad for the stomach, so what should you do? You should chew it up and spit it out. Uh, leeks are the opposite. They're bad for teeth and good for the stomach. What should you do with that? You should cook it and cook it and cook it until it becomes so soft you can just swallow it without having to chew it. Next, we said eating raw vegetables makes one a sallow skin. So Rav Yitzchak said 
that's only in the first meal after bloodletting. Ritz Kalkosa said that anybody who has eaten uh, raw vegetables in the morning should not talk to anybody else until the fourth hour of the day. The reason that is is because the other person hasn't eaten until the fourth hour of the day, and if he smells the vegetables on this person's breath, it'll be bad for him, having not eaten himself. Now, the Gemara records that Rav Yitzchak also said that it is forbidden for a person to eat vegetables before four hours into the day. Now, we had an incident that happened. A member of and Ravashi were sitting together. They brought them vegetables, raw vegetables, and it was before fourth hour of the day. A member of Ravashi ate. Mazurcha didn't eat. They said to him, well, why aren't you eating? You're not eating because you don't want to... Um, because you hold like... Rabbi Yitzchak says that if you ate raw vegetables in the morning, you're not supposed to talk to anybody. But here you are, you're talking to us, and we ate it, so you must not hold away. So he said, no, that's not the problem. The problem is the other thing he said. Rabbi Yitzchak said that you're not allowed to eat raw vegetables before the fourth hour of the day, because it's not healthy. So that's why I'm not eating it. Now, the Bible said that anything which is too small, meaning it is immature, it's not fully grown, that if you eat that, that'll make you short. So Rav Chisda said that's even a gdi, a kid, a goat, that you could buy for a zuz because it is so rich and so fatty that it costs that much money. And uh, the Gemara also says that it's only a problem if it has not grown to at least one quarter of its full size. If it grew to a quarter of its full size, you don't have to worry about it. Now he said if you eat anything whole, it is revitalizing. Rav Papa said even the small fish called gildany, which grows in, which live in a place called Bay gili in swamps so these are very small fish so if you eat those so that's revitalizing if you eat the whole fish in one shot next the rice had said that somebody who eats the part of an animal which is near its life force is revitalizing or yaakov said which part of the animal is that the throat Gemara says that rava rava used to say to his servant if you're going to bring me meat please bring me the part of the meat that the bracha of shechita was set on because that's the throat the neck and that is revitalizing now, the Mishnah said that you should eat cabbage because it's filling and beets because it is curing. It is has medicinal value. So the Gemara says that seems to imply that cabbage does not have medicinal value. But it's not true. We have a different price that says there are six things that are good for curing people. Um, and they are as follows. Cabbage is number one. And then beets. And then mint water. And is dried out. Dried out mint water. And the fourth stomach of an animal, the womb of an animal, the uterus, and the Yeseris Akavid, the diaphragm of the animal. So you see that here on the list we have cabbage. So you might say, no, cabbage is good because it's filling and it is curing. It has both values. Okay, now the Gemara had said the Brysa we saw before says that woe is to the stomach that has a turnip passing through it. So the Gemara says, what's the problem with a turnip? We have, Rava used to tell his servant that when you go to the market, if you see turnips in the market, don't ask me what I want with my bread, because that's what I want for sure. So you see, turnips are good. So the Gemara says that you have to soften the sting of the turnip, and there's a number of ways of doing it. Abaye said you could do it by eating meat with it. Rava said you could do it by eating wine with it. Rav also said you could do it by eating meat. Shmuel said you could do it by making a big fire with a lot of wood and cooking it up. Rabbi Yechon said, yeah, wine w- works. The Gemara quotes that, Rava Seter of Papa, you are a beer maker. You make beer from tomorrow, from dates. So what do you do with your t- t- turnips? How do you counteract it? We drink wine. We use that. So he said, um, I do it with wood. And Papa's wife used to burn 80 logs of wood over cooking the turnips so that it should not be problematic. Okay, now the Gemara quotes a brisa, somebody who eats small salted fish. Sometimes it can kill you. What are the times? If it's the 7th day after it was salted, the 17th day after it was salted, or the 27th day after it was salted, and some say the 23rd day after it was salted. And it's only a problem if it is partially roasted. But if it's fully roasted, it's not a problem. And even if it is partially roasted, it's not a problem as long as you didn't drink beer afterwards. But if you drink beer afterwards, it's also not a problem. Okay, now we go back to the Mishnah for a minute here. The Mishnah said that somebody who drinks water because he's thirsty, he says the Shachalana thing where he says, what other reason would you drink water? He says, if you have something stuck in your throat. If something stuck in your throat, you don't say a Shachal because you're not drinking it for its value. 
you're just drinking it to get rid of something. Now, if Tarfin said that the bracha on water is born of Fashion Abbas of Chesroy, none. It says Rav Bar Hanan asked the Baye, or maybe it was Rav Yosef, what's the halacha about this? And he said, go see what's doing out there. And the truth is that people do seem to have the meaning to say Bar Nefashois after they drink water, and that is the halacha, and the end of the daf, and the end of the parak.